very welcome to this year's Christel Stendahl Memorial Lecture. I'm Helen Engner from the Center for Interfaith Dialogue in Stockholm, and we arrange this together with Paideia, the, let me get this right, the European Institute for Jewish Studies in Sweden, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Britta Stendahl, Christer's widow, sends her greetings. Uh, some years she has managed to have her yearly visit to Sweden in connection with our lecture, but not this year. But we have another uh, representative of the Stendahl family, uh, Dr. Ole Stendahl. There are you, but you're very welcome. Nice to have you with us. So this is in memory of our former bishop, Christer Stendahl, who was bishop in Stockholm for only four years, but four very important years, I think, for us, for the theological reflection in this diocese. And I know many of us who sit here were students during his time or worked with him then as a bishop's advisor, as our present bishop Eva did. Uh, so many of us have connections, and I think many of us have read his works because he was a pioneer in the field of uh, Jewish-Christian relations with his books and publications on that subject. And so we are so very privileged today to have Professor Mary Boyce from Union Theological Seminary in New York as our speaker. She is also one of the very important persons in Jewish-Christian relations as, and has written a lot of books on this. And I think that Mary Boyce uh, sees herself very much as an educator, someone who wants to uh, impart the ideas of Jewish-Christian dialogue to a wider audience and to explain these tricky questions in a way that is accessible to people. Um, so I think uh, to save time, because you don't want to listen to me, you want to listen to <laughs> Professor Boyce. So please, Mary Boyce, the floor is yours. I want to begin by thanking all of you for coming uh, to the Church of Sweden and particularly to the Diocese of Stockholm and to the Center for Interfaith Dialogue and especially to you uh, for your hospitality. It's been splendid. I only came yesterday and I leave with regrets tomorrow, but uh, it's, it's terrible if you have a job, how it interferes with one's <laughs> education. Uh, it's, I've been uh, privileged to be in Sweden a couple of times before, uh, even in February. Uh, so uh, it does feel a little like February today, but uh, um, so it, it's a pleasure. And um, I know that my many friends who work in Jewish Christian relations in New York feel in solidarity uh, with all of you. So thank you for coming. Uh, the title of my lecture today is Turn It and Turn It Again. The Vital Contributions of Christer Stendhal to Jewish-Christian Relations. And let me begin with a text. Turn it, that is Torah, and turn it again. For everything is in it, and contemplate it, and grow gray and old over it, and stir not from it. For thou canst have no better rule. My title borrows an aphorism from the Mishnah, an early third century compendium of rabbinic commentary and law. I confess that in borrowing, I've altered what was likely its original meaning, turning the scroll again and again. But as a modern formed by books rather than scrolls, the turning I have in mind today focuses on our need as Christians to find new meanings in our texts. Texts that seem on the surface to justify the church's superiority to the synagogue. To turn and turn and turn again our texts 
is to engage in the holy work of seeking understanding. And we have an ethical obligation to confront harmful interpretations and to draw upon scholarly resources that provide us with new readings. My original intent in this lecture was to lift up key elements of biblical scholarship that offer such rich possibilities in our time for reconceiving the church's relationship to the Jewish people. But as I reviewed many of Christopher Stendhal's writings, this theme, as original intent, became intertwined with and subordinated to his insights, particularly his overturning of texts from the Apostle Paul that converted the way many scholars read Paul. Two key essays of the early 1960s of this, quote, extraordinarily far-sighted scholar, end quote, in the words of Magnus Zetterholm, gave rise to a new view on a very long interpretation of Paul. Because Professor Stendhal upended Martin Luther's reading of Paul, and he did this precisely as a Lutheran. Moreover, his profound pastoral sensi sensibilities complemented his enormous erudition <coughs> and his influence on the field of New Testament scholarship. I want to just give a little anecdote uh, that one of my colleagues told me. He was studying uh, at Harvard Divinity School in 1974-75, and Christian Stendhal had just returned from sabbatical where he was going to write a commentary for the Anchor Bible series on Romans. And he came into class, or so my colleague says, with the uh, two-volume commentary of Raymond Brown on the Gospel of John. And he said to the class, if this is what the commentary has become, it's not for me. <laughs> and I say this as a student of Raymond Brown, while I'm not primarily a, a biblical scholar, I want to point out two different ways that people make an influence on the field. Raymond Brown was an exegete's exegete. He wrote very lengthy and learned commentaries and has made a tremendous impact throughout the world with his scholarship. But Christian Stendhal did a great deal of lecturing. Many of his essays still retain that flavor of orality. And he made a tremendous impact because of the plain spoken way in which he made his insights accessible. He too has made a tremendous influence on the world of scholarship, no less erudite than Raymond Brown, but making a different choice in terms of his pastoral sensibilities. He had an astonishing ability to express significant theological and biblical insights in fresh and memorable ways. His passion lay in working with what he termed the public health department of biblical studies, <laughs> seeking alternate ways to interpret texts that have caused, again in his words, harmful fallout. Once asked by someone who had studied his publications why he wrote so much about women and Jews, he replied that these were two rather striking issues on which the Christian tradition and in the case of women, the whole scriptural tradition, has clearly had a detrimental and a dangerous effect. I think the late Bishop of Stockholm would feel great empathy with what the current Bishop of Rome, Pope Francis, has expressed. I see the church as a field hospital after a battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugar. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds. Heal the wounds. The privilege of returning to his work for this lecture has heightened my respect for Stendhal's profound contributions to healing the wounds Christians over the millennia have inflicted on Jews. Wounds that have resulted in part from supersessionist readings of biblical texts, that is, seeing that the church supersedes the Jews. 
It is in this context that I knew him personally, though not well. He headed a small group to which I belonged that was responsible for organizing the 1983 National Workshop on Christian-Jewish Relations. I confess I was a bit of a starstruck member of this group. I was a junior professor at Boston College, and he was the former dean of Harvard Divinity School and a major New Testament scholar. In an attempt to stay true to the way in which he expressed his profound insights in simple, even disarming ways, I've organized my lecture today around four of his phrases or sentences. I have compiled a brief sayings source S, <laughs> using his plain spoken language to address issues that still confront the churches in our time. So, saying one, it's not about me. In a number of his essays, Professor Stendhal spoke about the principle of tua res agitur. It is your case that is dealt with, or more colloquially, it's all about you. That sense of the biblical story being his story nurtured his initial attachment to the Bible. In an essay written toward the end of his life called Why I Love the Bible, which by the way you can, um, Helene has the uh, link, his son John reads it. Uh, it's at a session at Harvard Divinity School. It's, it's a very moving thing, but anyway. In that essay, he talks about how as a young man, he had begun to feed on the mysteries of God. This is a quote. It was an intellectually most stimulating awakening. I felt like Peter and I felt like Paul, especially when they had negative feelings. I felt like all the disciples. Later, however, he learned ways of reading that were so much less ego-centered. Again, a quote. The Bible was really not about me, it was about many other things, in the long run, much more interesting things. It was about many things in many distant lands from many distant ages. Now it spoke to me from a great distance, of centuries and cultures deeply different from my own. And it began to be just by its difference that the fascination grew that it had a way of saying to me, there are other ways of seeing and thinking and feeling and believing than you have taken for granted. And it just added to my love. Thus, characteristically, he turned the principle of tua res agitur on its head. Quote, the Bible is not about me. That realization, he said in, the, in this essay, became the watershed of my love story with the Bible. And in many, in many senses, this simple statement, the Bible is not about me, encompasses Stendhal's revolutionary reading of Paul. In good Lutheran fashion, he had inherited an understanding of the letter to the Romans as of what he called a theological tractate about my soul. Even, he said, during the end of the Second World War when the camps in Auschwitz and Dachau opened up. That is, much of the Western Church interpreted Paul as being preoccupied by the same existential question that had gripped Luther. How can I find a gracious God? Because human beings could never live up to the demands of Torah, simplistically equated with Jewish law, their efforts to save themselves were fruitless. Following the law entailed a futile attempt to earn divine love through good works. Luther discovered that one could be saved from the penetrating self-examination that constituted the introspective conscience of the West through justification by faith and without the works of the law. Christ alone saved one from sin and meaninglessness. It is stunning to think of the younger Christian Stendhal, just six years after finishing his doctorate in Uppsala, challenging this fundamental Augustinian Lutheran axiom of Pauline interpretation. What chutzpah to charge the Western church with wrenching Paul from its original context, its original context. Paul, he first argued in 1960, possessed a robust conscience, unlike Luther, and he was not preoccupied with questions of sin and forgiveness. Nor was Paul concerned with Jewish observance of the law. 
It was the Gentile observance of Jewish boundary markers, such as the dietary laws and circumcision, that he criticized. Thus, when the apostle to the Gentiles spoke about justification, he did so to Gentiles in order to defend Jesus following Gentiles as full heirs to God's promises to Israel. I must admit to a certain self-consciousness when I use the term Gentile. From my early years of teaching at Boston College, during a class one time, this young student asked me if I would clarify the difference between a Jew and a Gentile. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that some of the times the terms we use are not really known uh, to a wider public, but at any rate. <laughs> Further, as Jindal argued in a lecture in 1963, Paul's mystical encounter on the Damascus Road was a call rather than a conversion, a new mission rather than a change of religion to Jew, from Jew to Christian. 1963, this is, this is an insight that has such potency to change the church. I'm not sure we really internalized it as a church. Stindall said, we must somehow recognize that Paul's message was related not to some conversion from the hopeless work righteousness of Judaism into a happy, justified status as a Christian. Rather, the center of gravity in Paul's theological work is related to the fact that he knew himself to be called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, an apostle of the one God who is creator of both Jews and Gentiles. Yet the seed of Stendhal's challenge in early 1960s fell on stony ground for many years. Judgment of Judaism as a legalistic religion, mired in works of righteousness, was still firmly entrenched in the church and in the Christian academy. And perhaps this is an appropriate occasion to tell a story about another Stendhal. During a lecture in the Boston area, well over 20 years ago now, I had illustrated my point about the deep, uh, deep ways in which anti-Jewish perspectives were embedded in the church. And among the examples I chose was the 16th century hymn, Salvation Unto Us Has Come, which I had discovered in the Lutheran Book of Worship while teaching in a national Lutheran family camp, Holden Village, in my native Washington state. And the words in English, the lyrics in English, are as follows. I'm going to sing it for you. That's a moment of grace for you. <laughs> Salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is our mediator. Theirs was a false, misleading dream who thought God's law was given that sinner, sinners might themselves redeem and by their works gain heaven. The law is but a mirror bright to bring the inbred sin to light that works within our nature. And yet the law fulfilled must be, or we were lost forever. Therefore God sent his son that he might us from death deliver. He all the law for us fulfilled, and thus his father's anger stilled, which over us impended. I thought this was a superb illustration of anti-Jewish perspectives. But in conversation at the end of the lecture, Reverend John Stendhal, pastor of the Lutheran Church of the Newtons, just a mile from where I was living, Riley pointed out to me that the hymn was meant in the first instance as a critique of Roman Catholicism, <laughs> not of Judaism. <laughs> and what a pleasure it is to know that in this time, this chasm between the Lutheran tradition and the Catholic tradition has in many ways been closed, not forever or firmly, but uh, that, that we can be together, that we would even invite a Catholic uh, to, into the, the center of the Church of Sweden. <laughs> I'll never quote the Pope. <laughs> Not that I'm known for quoting the Pope a lot. <clears throat> uh, Christopher Stendhal's work in the early 1960s has become foundational for what biblical scholars today call new perspectives on Paul that modernist Zetterholm so ably analyzes in his book on the approaches to, the, to Paul. But that's a longer and more complicated story than I want to tell this afternoon. 
What I want to do is to, is to return to the watershed principle for reading the Bible that Stendhal talks about. It's not about me. And I want to turn it on its head. Yes, it is about me, particularly if the Pharisees are involved. For many Christian preachers and teachers, the Pharisees in particular serve as foils for the teaching of Jesus. Jesus offers the way of justice, mercy, and love, in contrast to the self-righteousness, legalism, and hypocrisy of the Pharisees. The Pharisees represent the aridity of Judaism, whereas Jesus reveals the abundant life of Christianity. Maybe this kind of preaching doesn't happen here in Sweden, but it certainly continues to happen in the United States. The New Testament portrait of the Pharisees, while complicated, is by and large negative. That depiction, however, is part of a later polemic on the part of some followers of Jesus, not from the day of Jesus. There were these disputes in which there were divisions about who should be leaders and what was the true way of following God. And as many scholarly and popular commentaries have pointed out in the course of the last 25 years or so, the Pharisaic movement had a great deal in common with Jesus' movement. Both sought the renewal of Israel. Now among the problems with making Pharisees the representatives of a moribund Judaism, that's a problem in and of itself, of course, is that we Christians accustom ourselves to negative judgments regarding Judaism because Pharisee becomes then a sort of a stand-in for Judaism. <clears throat> Thus, when real Jews, real live persons, appear in front of us and these certain texts are read, the experience can be and should be unsettling. For example, as part of my work as a scholar in residence some years ago at the University of Notre Dame, I taught, uh, I did some various teaching uh, uh, in classes of various colleagues and friends, and one was an upper-level theology course taught by the <coughs> rabbi and medieval scholar who held a chair in Jewish studies, the late and beloved Rabbi Michael Signer. After a few introductory remarks, it was an undergraduate class and trying to kind of get some engagement, I invited the students to begin a study of a passage from the Gospel of Matthew, in which Jesus engages in a heated diatribe against the scribes and Pharisees. This is from the 23rd chapter. So a student volunteered, I probably volunteered her, uh, to read the passage aloud. I'm just going to read part of the passage from Matthew. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one father on earth. And the reader stopped. The passage goes on. She just stopped. She closed her Bible and she said, I cannot read this anymore in front of Rabbi Signer. A strange quiet pervaded the room. Something had hit home. Though this was a familiar passage, at least to those few who go to church, it was only on this occasion, in the presence of a Jew who was their beloved teacher, that they experienced this equilibrium. But why don't we Christians experience this equilibrium more often? Stendhal's reading of Paul has implications for how we understand Pharisaic Judaism, although he did not himself develop that. And in his very early work, his work on the Bible and women, you can see some of this polemic against Pharisaicism has been, in, that he's internalized that too. The considerable literature on the Pharisees that has emerged in recent years 
overturns the conventional portrait that's been so useful to preachers, that I understand. Uh, in driving a wedge between Jesus and Judaism. Because among many groups seeking to reorient Jewish life, the Pharisees were a lay scribal movement, a school of thought, if you will, that protected and enhanced Jewish identity through teachings centered on practices such as Sabbath observance, tithing, fasting, following the, the norms for diet and purity. Yet Christians have been reluctant to absorb these insights. It's there in popular literature. There's an abundance of resources. But I think the new understanding of Pharisees is simply an inconvenient truth, borrowing the title of Al Gore's book on climate. This becomes clear from the excerpt that I just read from Matthew 23. Because if we really pay attention to the scholarship, we would have to recognize that Matthew 23 is about us. It is about me. It's a diatribe against our misuse of religion, our hypocrisy, our susceptibility to privilege and flattery. So too, what if the fulminating of Israel's prophets against the people's infidelity to the covenant is not only about the Israelites back then, but about us today? So, in conclusion to this first section, I agree with Christian Stindl. The Bible is not about me, but I append. Sometimes the Bible is about me. What we require is the wisdom to know the difference. Part two. <laughs> but words like that grow legs and walk out of their context. This memorable phrase occurs in a, uh, in a lecture that he gave in the early 1990s in which he explored the notion of religious pluralism and at the outset of the essay, he identified three biblical passages that seemed to really close the door on religious pluralism. After a very brief exposition of each, he shows how these passages are far more complex than they appear, and that in matters of religion, we do not have a situation of zero sum. And this question of zero sum was taken up in the very first of these Christopher Stendhal lectures by my uh, recently retired Union colleague Paul Nitter. Uh, so I won't go in that direction. I'm not taking that phrase, but I want to take one that occurs shortly thereafter. This unpretentious phrase, words like that grow legs and walk out of their context. By saying this, he encapsulated the difficulty posed by texts in the New Testament that give rise to negative views of Jews and Judaism. In the Gospel of John, for example, the Jews are connoted with virtually everything negative in that Gospel. Fear, murmuring, murderous intent, intent diabolical origins, blindness, darkness, and death. <coughs> Arguably, of all the words that grew legs, the one that grew the largest and most destructive legs is this from John. Crucify him. Crucify him. Because the texts that assign culpability for the crucifixion of Jews, of Jesus to Jews, walked right out of the realm of intra-Jewish disputation and marched proudly into the supersessionist language of the early church. The disparaging words of our early church writers in turn contributed to the church's deadly legacy of denigration of Judaism as a legalistic and obsolescent religion. Depictions of Jews as disloyal and treacherous people helped us to fuel violence in the Crusades and pogroms. The Christ killer charge in all its varied manifestation enabled the Nazi genocide. I realize that's a large claim. I'll lay it here and not develop it. But I think I can sustain that charge. Christian interpretations of the death of Jesus that blame Jews have done unspeakable harm not only to Jews, but to the moral integrity of the church. And it's mortifying to discover the depth and breadth of the violence against Jews, both rhetorical and physical, that has overshadowed the preaching and teaching about the death of Jesus. The bitter offerings we Christians have brought to the banquet of biblical interpretation haunt us 
requiring us to fast from triumphalism. As Stendhal writes in the introduction to his monograph, Holy Week Preaching, our celebration of Holy Week must be one of repentance in the effort to uproot every possible plant of anti-Semitism. Repentance must be founded on the recognition that interpretations of biblical texts have real consequences for real people. So we Christians must take responsibility for the words that grew legs and develop the capacity to inspire and sustain violence. And we must grieve for the detrimental and dangerous effect, again, Jindal's words, that have had on the lives of real people, particularly Jews, women, and slaves. To take responsibility for the consequences of how we have used biblical texts involves more than intellectual knowledge, although it certainly does require careful thought. It necessitates the courage to be affected by the wounds of history that Christianity has inflicted, and to be responsive to disturbing truths about one's own tradition. And it was also Stendhal who reminded Christians with regard to Jews and Judaism that we are obliged to honor the commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. To put it plainly, Christians have used our text to bear false witness against Jews, albeit often because we have assumed that the texts were factual. So it's not a matter of rewriting the text, but of rereading and reinterpreting them. Situating texts in their historical context is key. And since crucify him was the most damaging of all of those, it is crucial that we place the passion and crucifixion in their historical framework. Because in the Roman Empire, crucifixion was a widespread mode of torture and murder imposed not only on Jesus, but on thousands of Jews and other groups over whom the empire ruled. And crucifixion was used because it had a deterrent effect, a chilling deterrent effect. It was highly organized, massive state terrorism intended to intimidate the vast peasant and slave populations of the Roman Empire into passivity. It was, in the words of Paula Fredrickson, a spectacle for the edification of those watching. Jesus was crucified by the authority of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, likely in collaboration with the Jewish high priesthood. Together, the priest high priesthood and the governor formed what Sloyan called, Gerard Sloyan calls the power class. Though the power was not equal, the Roman governor definitely had the control. And although the precise charge cannot be established with absolute confidence, it's likely that Jesus was viewed by Pilate as guilty of sedition for having preached about the counter kingdom, that is, the reign of God. So Jesus stands not in primary opposition to Judaism, but to the empire over whom Caesar rules, rules as Lord and Savior. Responsibility for the death of Jesus falls not to Jews, but to the Roman governor and therefore, in a sense, to the Roman Empire in alliance with the power class. Jesus, the Jew from Nazareth, suffers the excruciating death by crucifixion not as the lone victim of Jewish hostility to the Son of God, but as one of thousands of Jews and others whom the empire tortured as a deterrent, lest they resist its rule. Three, Christianity as a construct. Another key to interpreting sacred texts may be found in the recommendation Stendhal made in 1997 that we must stress again and again that Christianity is a construct that had not yet been formed, especially in New Testament times, and that the Jesus movement existed once as a Jewish way in Palestine and in the diaspora. This emphasis is virtually absent in the church today. Consider, for example, how casually we speak about Jesus' followers as Christians, as if with his death and resurrection, the ways between Judaism and Christianity had parted like the waters of the Red Sea. Were we to absorb that Christianity was a construct not yet formed in the first century of the Common Era, we would have to set aside simplistic dualisms and think more imaginatively. Such an act of the imagination might also reveal to us what a limited construct we made for through Judaism to be. Really, Jews and Christians 
whether today or in the past, are complex and capacious terms. Jewish and Christian identities were fluid in the early centuries, and Jew encompassed people in starkly different social, economic, political, and geographic realities. And in the New Testament period, and for some time thereafter, there were Jesus-following Jews and non-Jesus-following Jews. Awkward language, perhaps, but certainly more accurate. So instead of implying rigid boundaries, it's more accurate and pastorally responsible to present Jews and Christians in the first three centuries of the Common Era more as dialects than as separate languages. Perhaps we could think of the varieties of the ways that Spanish is spoken in Mexico and Puerto Rico. As the second century developed, however, Jesus-following Gentiles came to outnumber Jesus-following Jews. And Christians gradually became separate from Jews as a religious entity, but only over a lengthy period of time. And there was no single turning point of separation when the dialects became separate languages at different times, different circumstances, and in different locations. Further, to regard Christianity, for that matter, all religious traditions, as constructive, obliges us to examine interpretations, formulations, and practices that may no longer serve us well or may be harmful, particularly in our relationship with the religious mm -hmm. others. In Stendhal's challenging assertion, he said, I always felt that to speak about the uniqueness of Christianity or the uniqueness of Christ does more for the ego of the believer than it does for God. <laughs> I think that's a delightful sentence, and I was even more delighted to, follow, to read the next sentence, which came upon me as a total surprise. Uh, he said, and I recently discovered a book with a wonderful title, Has God Only One Blessing, which is a book that I wrote in 2000. Mm -hmm. Now, I wish he would have said I came across a wonderful book, not just a wonderful <laughs> title, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that you know, for my own little ego. Christopher Stendhal brilliantly deconstructed how many in the church thought about women, about Paul, and about Judaism. I suspect, particularly in the early the days, that he was seen as a dangerous threat to the very foundations of Protestant theology. Perhaps some still see him that way. But for many of us, however, he provides new conceptual foundations and formulations that contribute to the continuing work of constructing Christianity and thereby creating a new relationship with the Jewish people. So part four, my, and the last. Leave room for holy envy. As Stendhal frequently used an old Swedish expression, it is pathetic to hear mosquitoes cough. <laughs> he admitted, I don't know why this is funny, but in Swedish, it is funny. <laughs> I don't know why it's funny either, but I can enjoy his humor without having to own it. Which leads me to the fourth and final of my Stendhal sayings, leave room for holy envy, which he describes this way. When we recognize something in another tradition that is beautiful but is not ours, <laughs> we should not grab it or claim it. We Americans, it's interesting that he put it that way, uh, that sort of surprised me when I reread this this morning. We Americans, in our own imperialism, think that if we like something, we just incorporate it, and we think that we honor others by doing so. But that is not the way. Holy envy rejoices in the beauty of others. And this was one of his ground rules for interreligious dialogue. Allow others to define themselves, compare the best of their traditions with the best of your own, and leave room for holy envy. Holy envy is the preeminent sign that one is beginning to understand the tradition of the other, to recognize its power and beauty, yet refrain from taking it as one's own. I wrote this lecture during the intensity of this fall's Jewish holidays, and I should say that the school where I teach is directly across the street from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, and I have many friends on the faculty there. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini, Atzeret, and Simchas Torah. So much about these holidays 
gives rise to holy envy. The strength of celebrating in community, the depth and breadth of ritual practice that is not just in the synagogue, but especially in the home. The beauty of the blessings and dancing around the synagogue while holding the Torah scrolls aloft, a dance that then spills out into the streets. Rabbi Irving Greenberg refers to this celebration as holy pandemonium. <laughs> now that is wisdom Christian Stendhal would appreciate. After all, one of his other rules for reading the Bible is, don't be so uptight. So I began this lecture with the aphorism from the Mishnah about turning and turning the scrolls, a reference that takes on new meanings as we picture our Jewish friends dancing joyously with Torah scrolls last week. I conclude with gratitude for the blessings that Christian Stindl's own turning and turning and turning of texts brought to all of us. His commitment to the holy work of seeking understanding continues to be a blessing. And I am filled with holy envy for the Church of Sweden for bequeathing this great man to all of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.